world headquarters of Common Sense. Talk Radio. Much to do, much to talk about and much to discuss with Mr Peter Hitchens, who is here uh, with his regular Monday appearance. Peter, very good morning to you. Good morning. Fascinating piece, I thought, at the weekend about your visit uh, to Sevastopol, uh, the, uh, the the Ukrainian sort of uh, seaside town, uh, where there was a harbour where there were naval uh, officers walking around, both in Russian uniforms on the one hand and in Ukrainian uniforms on the other. Tell us a little bit about that before uh, for people who weren't able to read it. Well, it, it was something which very much... Uh, I was I changed my mind, but but concentrated my mind when I I went uh, I discussed with friends uh, what I might do to report on what was going on in that area. Right. It's now uh, twelve years ago, and made this journey in the summer of of twenty ten to Sevastopol, which had previously been a closed city. I had been there once before in Soviet times, but it was a very secret place, being one of the principal bases of the old Soviet Navy. And it, at that stage, was of course one of the points at which tensions between uh, Ukrainians and Russians living in Ukraine were beginning to show. Uh, all kinds of foolish things were going on. And so it was as if I, I wrote at the time. It was as if uh, uh, Wales had become independent of Britain and had, uh, had somehow or other, in the course of becoming independent, had also taken over Devon and Cornwall. Mm. And it started trying to impose the speaking of Welsh on Devon and Cornwall. Uh, there were a lot of lot of people in Ukraine who lived there perfectly happily since independence in 1991, 92, uh, who were finding that the, the the ethnic nationalism of the Kiev government was was more and more disturbing. Mm. And I saw divisions emerging. And the, interestingly, the places where I went, Sevastopol, particularly, and uh, uh, Donetsk, uh, the middle of the Don basin. Uh, which was actually founded by a Welshman, by the way. Uh, yes, and, I noticed uh, that. Fascinating, that, isn't it? Yeah, so we used to be called Yuzovka. His name was John Hughes. Yes. Uh, yes. And I, I also went to a, a, a former coal town uh, called Gorodka, known in Ukraine as Horlivka, which is now in the middle of the, 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 the awful war zone created since the secession of large parts of the Russian-speaking regions in 2014. The thing was that what I saw then was the beginning of something, and I reported on it, and I, I got quite severely attacked by some people for writing it at all. And what happened not long afterwards was the extraordinary event, which is still not understood or, or, or known about in this country, two years later in, in Kiev in 2014, uh, when the, the then government was overthrown, uh, which I see as being the, the real uh, beginning of the mm. crisis we now face, appalling thing, an absolutely shocking thing, which reduces me each morning I wake to it. I feel a sense of complete despair uh, that there is, there is red war uh, taking place in a European country. I just, it's just so appalling to me that we can have got ourselves to this state. Uh, that I, I just don't know what to do except to try to say we need to be careful to avoid this sort of thing ever yeah. happening again and to examine the, the things which led to it and and, uh, and and see what we can do to prevent it getting any worse or, or being repeated. But there's a very strange in in, the, in Western countries at the moment among people in, in government and parts of the media, a very strange it seems to be urge towards war and conflict. Yeah. Uh, which, which, it, once you see it, once you see human beings cowering in amid shell fire and having their homes destroyed, you say, "How can anybody possibly desire war?" But people, it seems to me, do, and I'm, I'm, I'm baffled by it. I mean, I suppose the reason for them doing it, and I'm, I'm not one of those, by the way, um, is that they see some of the footage coming out of of, uh, of Ukraine at the moment, and it does appear that there is one aggressor um and that's what you see and whether or not that is the case or, or we we will never know because we're not there but you know what you when you see ordinary civilians running for their lives and you know getting shot at as they do so you feel like you have to do something you feel i mean the human need to then say let's go after the aggressor and stop them is a kind of i know i, know, I get your your point that it's a very good yeah. one that, that they don't understand what they're talking about because they've never been in that situation no i'm not i can understand that completely and i i it, it, and there's a part of me that sympathises with it, but it's not. It's it, the point. I, I would go back further than this. It, you know, conversations that one might have had with American or British diplomats over the past twenty or fifteen years mm. since the disaster of the Iraq War, I, I felt uh, particularly the, the great desire to, to get involved violently in Libya 
uh, the great desire to get involved violently but covertly in Syria, where huge amounts of money were spent, by, particularly by the Americans and by some Middle Eastern countries, to foment a terrible war, mm. uh, which I think could have been avoided. A, a long desire to, 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 to maneuver ourselves into some sort of confrontation, perhaps violent with Iran, very much in the heart of a lot of policy making and think tankery in the West. This, this view that somehow the war is, is, is going to be necessary and we should be moving towards conflict. When I, I don't think that anything is solved by this. And then, when we get into these, into these messes and when, when Russia does this terrible thing of, 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 of invading aggressively uh, with a, a, another country, uh, people then turn to sanctions. Well, sanctions are, are, are terribly appealing in, in, in a sort of, again, a, a media way. But they always, always, always end up punishing the innocent poor. The people who will suffer from this lot of sanctions will be the poor people of Russia, just as the poor people of Iran and the poor people of, uh, of, of, of Iraq, who the, 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 the Iraqi middle class, before we started sanctioning Iraq, were very, very pro-Western. Yeah. They're not quite the same now because their lives were destroyed by it, and they were not our official targets, but they will always, always suffer. People should just think more about what they do. Uh, the, 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 obviously, the, 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 the Russian behavior here is, is unspeakable and unforgivable, mm. but the circumstances in which it took place were created by people who, who were warned of this danger. Uh, that it could be to this, and they paid no attention mm. at all. And I, I just think that it's, it, it, it's, it's it, in condemning the Russian aggression, one must also examine the background to the thing and say there are other reasons why this has happened. Yes. And to some extent, they have been the fault of our supposed statesmen. Well, that would come as no great surprise to those of us who have studied those statesmen over the course of time, because there's not much they've got right, to be honest, is there? No, there isn't, is there? I mean, there really isn't much you can trumpet. When it's I saw, a very saw, poor record. I mean, when I, I saw I, Gordon Brown at the weekend talking about how we had to get, get, get involved militarily, I was just thinking to myself, really? Um, I'm not sure we want to hear from you at this point in time. But uh, the other thing, Peter, though, is what would you do now? Because, you know, taking your points as they are, uh, and it should have been foreseen and it should have been, um, you know, something that we knew would happen, what can you now do, though? Well, I think anybody who's seen the face of war, who's seen what a human head looks like after a bullet has passed through it, must desire uh, peace. And then people will say, well, so what? You want to reward these people for their violence or, mm. or, or, or make a compromise with evil? And I say, well, as a matter of fact, uh, the war itself for people such as we are, vulnerable, soft-skinned human beings, is so terrible that, yes, we do need to try to seek some kind of compromise. The danger at the moment is we could turn the whole of Ukraine into a permanent war zone, perhaps stretching out for decades ahead, a place of complete misery in which nobody will be able to live. Uh, millions of people will have to, have to begin new lives as refugees, uh, and the, the, the consequences of that will be appalling. So I think it is the responsible thing must be to see if we can find some sort of way of compromising before this gets any worse. And I would urge very much everybody involved in politics and diplomacy in, in, in the West to try and make some sort of effort to do this. War is so terrible. And imagine if it came here. Imagine if somehow or other this country had become the, 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 the object of the beady eyes of the strategists uh, and, and, and the, the efforts of our government were being decried as, 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 uh, as, as, as wrong. Uh, international intervention was proposed. No fly zones were were imposed, other people's armed forces were over our heads. Imagine how desperate it would feel to be in any British city while that was going on uh, and think, why can't this stop? Yeah. And the, your, your own, your, your main objective would be to get it to stop. And I think that it's, it's, it's all very well to be tough and principled and say, yes, yes, we must fight on and defeat the, the invader and all the rest of it. But at what cost are you prepared to do this? Mm. Uh, in the end, uh, people, it, there is no such thing as, uh, as a surgical strike, um, even if, however hard combatants try uh, to avoid killing civilians, and a lot of them actually do, uh, they will be killed and maimed, and their homes will be destroyed, and their lives will be destroyed. As long as war goes on, 
innocent people are in danger. So there has to be some argument to say, can we find a way to bring this to an end as soon as possible? Yeah, but if the way to find that end is, is somehow to subjugate some of the people, um, they may not be willing to accept that anyway. And they do seem, the Ukrainians, as, as I see it anyway, to be a particularly proud nation. They certainly don't appear to want to give in. Um, so I'm not sure that that point can be achieved, can it? Well, no, no, nor am I. It's very difficult. And one of the problems with modern wars in, in, in the age of mass media and now the Internet, and this is, this is a point made by Winston Churchill at the beginning of the 20th century, so the, the, the wars of, the, of democracies are far, far worse than the wars of kings because to get wars in democracies, you have to get the people to support it. And therefore, you have to raise to a very high level uh, the desire for for victory in war, the belief that your side is utterly principled and right. And once you've done that, how do you climb down? It's much, much harder. It's why the first one, the, most of the states in Europe by 1915 had realized that the First World War was a catastrophe and disaster from which nobody would, would benefit. But they couldn't end it because they'd all mobilized their mm. populations to believe that it was a great war for civilization. And politically, they didn't dare stop it. So it had to go on for another three years of hell. This is the difficulty we have, which is why voices such as you and me should not be raised in, in, in demanding more war and more violence. We should be very much taking this, the side of peace. Uh, even if people say, oh, well, that means you're weak and feeble. I mean, that's something you have to put up with, honestly. Well, I mean, you've put up with quite a lot over the course of your career, as, as indeed have I. I dare, I dare say we're used to that. But but I suppose if you were going to be, be philosophical about war, I suppose the only one that was really worth winning or having was World War Two, wasn't it? Well, wars are, wars are worth having when you come under attack and you must defend yourself. And that, that is fundamental. But, the, 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 but what I've always said is the, the Second World War was certainly ultimately a just war. Yeah. Uh, but we have tended in, 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 our, in our writing and filmmaking and documentary making about it after to have glossed over quite a lot of aspects of it to make ourselves believe it was a good war. Mm. Uh, I don't think it was good. I think it was absolute hell. I think an awful lot of, 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 of good, kind, gentle people were massacred and had their lives destroyed in it needlessly. And I think we have to understand uh, that it wasn't good, even if it was just. We should never glamorize war. Mm. Uh, as people sometimes do, and uh, we should. That's why I I, I reproduced uh, use, uh, um, I, I reproduced uh, Sherman's great quote about uh, war being hell in my article on yeah. Sunday to remind me. This was a man who knew war, who fought war, who was a very effective general, and he said, he said Look, "Please stop romanticizing this terrible thing. Mm. Nobody who's experienced it thinks it's good." No, and 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 and, and I, I think that's absolutely right. But I suppose there does come a time when uh, you have to go to war to defend others, even though you may not be under attack, no? Yes, but, there, but all wars have to end. And, the, and the, 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 the quicker they end, for the, certainly for the sake of, of, of ordinary human beings, the better. Mm. And that means that necessity, the whole point of di diplomacy is compromise, is the, the willingness to admit you can't have everything that you want that the world will not be wholly just. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't mean surrender. But I have to say, I think there was probably a compromise available before this war if people had been more interested in pursuing it. Uh, and there might be some sense in trying to revive it, but I, it, there will eventually be a compromise. Well, there will have to be, won't How many people, be, how many people it... are going to ha have to die in, in, in between now and then? Right. Uh, for a compromise which will be very similar to the one we could have got now. Yes. Well, that is part of the problem, isn't it? Because you've got now, um, you've got the Russian uh, experience, which is entirely different to to our experience in terms of how they're seeing it, uh, how they're living through it. Um, I was listening to a report from Moscow the other day uh, from the Chanel shop in Moscow, where apparently the people who are very wealthy are still very wealthy. They're still going into Chanel and buying £1,500 bags. Um, uh, to take home with them, and they'll never have uh, any shortage of funds, no matter how much the oligarchs get clamped down upon. Um, oh, they'll be fine. They, they, those people will be fine. The, yeah. the Russian rich will be fine, but the Russian poor will not. No, and the Russian middle class, which has kind of emerged, you might say, I suppose, since the advent of what you might call loosely capitalism, uh, they're the ones who are hurting. Well, they, they are, they're also, I have to tell you, they're the ones who've most, mostly been out on the streets protesting against the war very courageously. It's, yeah. that, it's that Moscow middle class, which was the great hope of, of, of a new Russia, that they might uh, finally develop 
a, a middle class which could sustain a, a law governed democracy in yeah. that uh, in that country, uh, they will certainly suffer and their position will will be weakened. And war damages everything good. Yeah. And what about the sanctions then? Are you against those? I'm against sanctions always because I, on every occasion when they've been in, in, in imposed, they make us feel good. They look, they make politicians look as if they're doing something, but in the they're very hard to end once they've started. And I don't think there's ever been an instance of them where they haven't hurt the innocent poor terribly, uh, and in, in in ways which which perpetuate misery for, for years to come. I just think uh, fight a war if you must, but don't pretend that sanctions are a substitute. For war, or that they, uh, or that they can be applied without hurting innocent people, because they cannot. Yes, no, I think that's right. Um, as far as what happens now goes, I mean, is Putin, in your view, now completely entrenched? Uh, can he be able? Can he be convinced to stop the fighting, or is he now somebody that just has to be somehow removed? Well, I think one of the problems is that we don't actually know what the objectives of this invasion are. We've never known. Uh, did he intend to take the whole of Ukraine? Uh, did he intend to take certain parts of it? Uh, did he intend what is more or less an act of terror uh, to frighten Ukraine in, 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 into behaving differently? Did he intend to destabilize the whole post-war order? What is his aim? What, 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 what did he, what does he hope to achieve? Does he actually wish to capture Kiev uh, or does he not? We don't know. I have no idea. I don't pretend to have any idea. And without knowing that, you don't know uh, whether he's he's already failed uh, or not, I, the sense that I get from 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 what I read is that almost everybody in the in the Russian elite is horrified by this action. Yeah. Uh, believes it was the most terrible mistake and will end in disaster. And it doesn't look to me, though I, it's very difficult to tell. It doesn't look to me as if the Russian army uh, is performing particularly effectively, which is itself an interesting thing. Uh, we, we've been told for ages that Russia is a threat to all its neighbours. The truth is, and has always been. Uh, and I have tried to say this from time to time, this is a, quite a small economy and quite a small society. Its armed forces aren't that strong. Mm. And it may well be that they've exhausted their strength, in which case, uh, in which case it would seem to me that people in the, the Russian elite are going to be talking quite loudly about whether M Mr. Putin should remain in office for much longer. Uh, he may well be removed by his own people. It's not by any means to be ruled out. To, to, to go to war and to fail, is the quickest way uh, to losing office in, in, for, for, for any despot. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Well, we shall remain, I suppose, on uh, on guard. I mean, meanwhile, there's kind of the uh, collateral damage, I suppose, that's being done to various sections of Europe, um, including the energy sector, you know, um, the inability, perhaps, of, of the West to do anything other than just watch and hope for the best, really, which is kind of where we seem to be. Um, it's slightly worrying, isn't it? It's very worrying. And, and that's the other thing about war is it, it always does grave economic harm. It harms civilization. It harms it, it, it harms all the things we're used to. Uh, and and it, it will also mean people, I think, losing their jobs, finding they're living at much lower standards of living than they, than they were previously used to. And it will intensify uh, the already grave economic damage which the, which the Western world is undergoing after the COVID panic. And it's not going to be an easy time. War always destroys. It always ruins. It's, it's, it's why I'm so against it. Yes. Uh, they, but what can one do? I can't. You know, he, he, the, we are all now at the mercy of events which have been set in train by, by this lunatic invasion. Mm. No, I think that is why we probably feel quite so helpless as we do. Peter, thank you very much indeed.